Um, but first I would like to admit that I'm not a specialist in brewing, not a specialist in malting, so the question is what am I doing here? What I'm going to tell, to tell today? Well, I'm going to tell something about microbes. Uh, I'm a microbiologist, more in particular a microbial ecologist. So what do we study? We study microbes. We study microbes in the environment. We study interaction between mi microbes, between uh, the long uh, living environment as well. Our research group, um, as a focus on microbial community ecology, and we study both natural and man-made um, engineered ecosystems. We focus on both beneficial and harmful microbes. Um, systems that we study, of, that we have studied so far, include uh, natural systems like soils, water, rhizosphere, insect guts, but also man-made systems, so in, uh, systems which are ma made by man, engineered uh, systems, like food and beverage production including uh, brewing, um, bioethanol production, and water production. One of the ecosystems we've studied is also malting. We've studied that in collaboration with a group of, uh, of Guido Arts uh, from Kaho SL. And um, this ecosystem actually contains two metabolically active compounds. We have the grains, the barley grains, but we also have, on the other hand, microbes. And microbes are a very important compound uh, in this uh, system. So, um, going back to, to, to malt, um, so what is, what is malting or why are we doing this? Guido gave a, a very nice introduction to my talk. Um, I, would, uh, I would like to add a few, a few more things on this. Uh, but first, uh, as a start, so uh, why, why are we malting? So malting, actually we want to create enzymes. Uh, enzyme, hydrolytic enzymes and degradation of the grain structure. Now these uh, enzymes, uh, why are they important? Like Hido also said, important for uh, the malt quality. It softens the grain, um, assists water separation, so better filtration. Um, the starch can be converted in the fermentable uh, sugars during mashing. Nutrients are generated for yeast uh, to support yeast growth and maintenance, and we prevent undesirable proteins floating into the beer. The process. Um, I'm focusing on the process because it's important to also know the different steps in the process when we're going to talk about the microbes uh, uh, occurring in these steps. So actually, the malting uh, can be divided in uh, three steps. The first step is steeping. So the grains are submerged during 24, 48 hours until a water content of 40, 42, 46 percent is reached. In general, the water temperature is about 10 to 15 degrees Celsius, which is quite cold and has, of course, an influence on the microbes. Second step, germination. So in this step, the grains are allowed to germinate under humid aerobic conditions, uh, about 15, 20 degrees Celsius for a few days, three to five, six days to obtain the green malt. What is happening in this step? Uh, so the enzymes are produced by the uh, aluron layer um, and the cell walls of the endosperm can then be hydrolyzed. And then it can be accessible for uh, enzymes. Last step, the kilning. Kilning is actually uh, the drying step uh, for about 21 hours. Uh, temperature is increasing from 50 up to 85 degrees or even more. And like Keto said, uh, until a water content of about 4% is reached. Maybe not the best, uh, I leave that up to you. Anyway, the kilning stops the biochemical reactions. Uh, several uh, color flavor compounds are produced during this step. So three steps uh, uh, in the malting. Now we're going to talk about the microbes in malting. So like I said uh, in the introduction, microbes have a, an important function during malt, uh, malting uh, next to the grains. Well, these microbes can affect the malting performance and the malt quality in the end. These effects can be beneficial or can be disadvantaged. Uh, beneficial, we, uh, like we said, uh, enzymes that are produced. Uh, harmful microbes also exist. Um, they can spoil, for example, the grain or even the malt. So it's important to know which microbes are there, what are they doing, so to improve the malt characteristics, to ensure high, qual uh, high quality malt, we need more insights into the dynamics, the microbial communities that are involved in the malting process. And that was exactly what uh, we were studying a few years already ago, um, and I'm going to present some of the, uh, these results. First, microbiology. Uh, in the old days, uh, probably everyone 
in the audience knows this kind of techniques. This is plating, plating, counting colonies. So what you actually do is you have a sample, plate it on a, on a medium, incubate it for a couple of days, maybe even, uh, sometimes longer, and then the microbes start growing. You can isolate, you can identify, uh, and so on and so on. The main disadvantage of using this uh, technique is that it is uh, time and labor consuming. Uh, labor consuming. It can take a few days or a few hours. And importantly, it's limited to only those microbes that can be cultivated in laboratory conditions. And now you have to know that most microbes are not used to live in a, in, in a lab. So it's, it's estimated that, for example, from soils, only 1% of the microbes that occur in the soil can be cultivated in a lab. So therefore, uh, today we use other techniques, and these techniques make use of DNA, yes? So we all know uh, CSI Miami, this kind of uh, uh, programs. Uh, anyway, uh, people use DNA to identify uh, criminals and so on, but we can also use the DNA to identify uh, microbes. Um, to make it simple, um, DNA has only four letters. It's very simple, alphabet, A, T, C, G, and the sequence of these letters um, are actually unique for a particular organisms. So it, once you have the sequence, you know which microbe uh, is there. This can be on the, uh, so we, based on DNA, for example, we can distinguish between man and uh, animal, uh, father, son, but also we can distinguish between particular microbes. The question then is, do we need to sequence the whole genome, or can we use uh, smaller fragments uh, that give the same information? Well, just to show um, you, um, for example, the, the Human Genome Project, or the human genome, co contains about 3 billion base pairs. Yes, if you would uh, fill that in a, uh, or on paper, you would uh, end with a around 150 large uh, telephone books, yes. This is a closet uh, containing uh, the paper uh, work of the human genome. One closet, the numbers represent the different chromosomes, but as, as, a, as you can see, it's a big amount of, um, of, of information. So the question is, do we need all uh, this information to know which microbe is there? No, luckily there are some genes, uh, some marker genes, housekeeping genes, that we can use to identify particular microbes just based on, let's say, between three, 300 and 1,000 base pairs. So we're going to use this kind of uh, genes to identify microbes. Uh, the last couple of years, new techniques have, uh, have, have been launched into the market, and these are typically NGS techniques, next generation sequencing techniques, like, for example, 454 pyro sequencing, Illumina MySec sequencing, and based on these techniques, we can characterize complex microbial communities, and, will, and this will give us very detailed information of which microbes are in the system. Basically, the, this technique involves a couple of steps. We start with DNA extraction, so we isolate the DNA. We amplify a particular gene by uh, universal primers. We prepare a library, and then the sequencing is doing the work. Um, and the sequences can be analyzed by uh, bioinformatic pipelines that are available. So we end up with this kind of information. Uh, so, like I said, it's just a sequence of four letters, and this sequence um, can be identified, yes? We will it, obtain a few thousand, few hundred thousands of this kind of sequences, so with the software, these sequences are analyzed uh, or grouped together based on a threshold that we, that we give, and then, for example, the, uh, a representative sequence will be checked in a, a database to uh, know uh, to identify the sequence. So it's, you, you put it in here, this is, for example, GenBank, and uh, the, the result is an identification in this uh, particular example. It is uh, Lactobacillus plantarum, for example. Okay, this also means that when I, uh, a, few, a few years ago in my lab, it was always uh, crowded, people were working in the lab. When I'm working today into my lab, most of the time the lab is empty. Most people are sitting behind the laptop, behind the computer, doing the, da the data analysis. So we obtain a lot of data, and this data has to be analyzed by specific uh, bioinformatic, uh, bioinformaticians, uh, particular uh, programs. 
So coming back to uh, to, to the system we've studied, uh, so we um, we actually have uh, taken a couple of samples uh, into uh, during uh, the process, and we started with uh, the barley. So we had one batch of barley which was uh, given to uh, one malting company which had uh, two malting houses, one with the separate uh, germination rooms and a two floor kiln and the second uh, malting house had a short germination room with a one floor kiln. So we had one batch of barley which was malted in two different uh, malting houses and samples were taken from the barley after one day of germination, after five days of germination, and then the kilned malt was also sampled. We did this in 2010 and 2011, and in total uh, we obtained 14 samples. Uh, actually, I'm presenting uh, results from 14 samples, which were analyzed in duplicate. Okay, so uh, like I said, we, uh, we amplified a particular gene, in this case the 16S ribosomal RNA gene from bacteria, and we ended up with about 20,000 bacterial sequences. Yes, and these sequences uh, were grouped into what we call uh, operational taxonomic units. Uh, you can compare that with species, so it's a, a kind of species surrogate based on sequence uh, dissimilarity. So we ended uh, uh, with uh, 274 different OTUs. And then typically what we, uh, what, what we, what we look at is uh, some parameters. Uh, I will explain with a few figures in a minute. We look at richness, and richness, this means the number of species, the number of OTUs that are present in the sample. We look at evenness, and evenness takes into account the abundance of the species. So the, the more even a community is, the more close the species are in numbers. And then diversity, which is actually a combination of these both parameters. We can look at communities by um, uh, non-metric multidimensional scaling, visual compar uh, comparison, and then we can um, look at sequence distribution over different phyla. First, so this gives you an, uh, an overview of richness, diversity, and evenness. So richness is the number of OTUs, the number of species. And what you can see here, this is for the barley. This is after one day of germination, five days of germination, and this is the malt. So actually what we can see, that it's, it's quite limited. So we start with around 40 species on the barley, and we end up with around 100 uh, species on the malt. So the, the richness is going up. So the, the, the longer the process, the more species we have. We see also the same in the diversity, and we see also the same in uh, the evenness. So uh, richness, evenness, diversity go up during the process, except for uh, one sample taken in 2010. Okay, this is uh, an NMDS uh, plot. Um, well, actually, what this shows is how related communities are. So every dot, every dot here represents a community. Yes, and the closer two spots or two dots are, the more similar the communities are. So what we can learn from this figure in um, in purple we have the samples from 2010. In orange we have the samples from 2011. Filled triangle is um, malting house one. The open triangle is malting house two. So actually what do we see here? The samples group together according to the year of harvest. So samples of 2010 are together, samples of 2011 are together. Remarkable, the barley, irrespective of the, of the year, the barley communities are quite similar, yes? So what can we learn from this? So although that the, 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 the community on the barleys are quite similar in 2010, 2011, they evolve to different communities. Eh? The, the samples from 2010 are grouped together, from 2011 are grouped together. So probably or these results suggest that probably um, the, the conditions, the malting conditions, environmental conditions, which were different between both years, have a major impact on the communities occurring on the malt. What can we also learn from this figure? So what you see here is, uh, so we start from the barley, then it goes to this situation where we have the germinated uh, grains, one day of germination, five days of germination, and malt. So actually, the different steps have their own community, what you can also see here. The same was uh, true for 2011. This is a graph um, presenting uh, the sequence distribution over different uh, phyla. 
2010-2011. What do we see here? We see during molting four uh, dominant phyla, yeah? four dominant bacterial groups, including Firmicutes, Bacteroidetes, Actinobacteria, um, and then the Proteobacteria, mainly Gamma Proteobacteria. There is a difference between uh, both years, so 2010-2011. The main difference is what you see here. So in 2011, we had more Bacteroidetes, um, which were less here, and in 2010, we had more Firmicutes, Firmicutes, for example, Bacillus, Lactobacillus, and so on, and we also had more Actinobacteria. Um, and this is, well, this is important to note, is that the malt quality, like Hido said, malt quality has to do with, uh, with, with, uh, with filtration, that the malt quality in 2010 was better than in 2011. So maybe this was due to the different microbial communities present at that uh, stage. This is another graph actually presenting a bit the same. What you see here are the different steps. Uh, so the barley after one day of germination, uh, malting house one and two, after five days of germination, and this is the malt. So here again, you see the nice fluctuations of the different phyla over the process uh, with the differences between both um, years. So Firmicutas, most pro predominant in 2010, so here, the red ones, and the Bacteroidetes, the green ones, in 2011. This gives us a global view of the bacterial community during malting. Um, we ask ourselves the question, uh, what about lactic acid bacteria? Uh, can we zoom in on to uh, this group? So this is also what we did. Why are uh, lactic acid bacteria important? Um, because they, for example, they harbor uh, potential uh, biocontrol strains, which may restrict um, the growth of uh, pathogens of uh, toxinogenic fungi like Fusaria and uh, so on and so on. Many lactic acid bacteria are also used as a starter culture. Examples are Lactobacillus and Pediococcus. And uh, so it, it, it can be interesting to uh, look at uh, these communities. So that's what we did. From the 271 OTUs we found, around 30 were um, uh, lactic acid bacterial species, uh, representing about 25% of the sequences belonging to nine genera. This is the same, the same figure what you see here, so the different uh, st uh, stages in the process, and here you have the different uh, lab uh, genera. So what you can see here, again, is that there are dynamics, there is a fluctuation going on, and Streptococcus was the most dominant genus, so that's the gray one, in barley. As you can see, almost all sequences from uh, barley, the lab sequences, uh, represented uh, Streptococcus. And Lactobacillus was more, so that's the, that's the green one, Lactobacillus is more abundant in 2010 than in 2011, while in 2011, Lactococcus and Vicella is more presented. So you see some fluctuations here. So uh, I would like to conclude with, uh, with, with the following two slides. So actually what we showed is, although data are, are quite old from 2010, 2011, better techniques are available now which, uh, by which uh, much more deep, deeply can be sequenced. But anyway, I think we can say that um, we, uh, these techniques are are suitable um, to look at microbial communities in detail, um, to unravel the microbial dynamics in the malting process. Bas the main conclusions are that actually the, the, the overall bacterial richness is quite limited. We were a bit surprised to see that only between 40, 100 uh, species were there. Uh, if you compare that with, for example, a soil, in soils you can find uh, easily a few hundreds, a few thousands of different species. Um, these uh, richness and diversity and evenness parameters, they increased over the malting process. Um, malting resulted in different communities, of which the structure was mainly dependent on the year, rather than on the flora that were initially present on the barley or on the uh, malting house. And this can potentially be explained by environmental conditions. For example, weather conditions, air is used, uh, and uh, fresh air in 2010, 2011 uh, could be different. And the, the community dynamics uh, is influenced by the process steps, like, it's, uh, like you have seen, differences, barley, germination, and malt. Four phyla were found that uh, dominated the whole processes, uh, the whole process, uh, including the actinobacteria, bacteroidetes, firmicutes, and gamma proteobacteria. 
Labs were abundantly present with, with the dominance of Lactobacillus and Leuconostic in 2010 and Lactococcus and Weizella in 2011. Further research is still needed, uh, for example, to confirm the trends observed in our study. Um, it's very important uh, because this is actually like a descriptive study. Now, the next question is, what are these microbes doing in the process? What are the functions of these microbes? What, what does this actually mean? So therefore, uh, more research is needed. We focused on, uh, on bacteria. What about fungi? How important are fungi in this kind of process? And by, by bringing it all to together, I think, or I believe, that this can lead to a better microbiota management during, during malting, resulting in Let's hope then a uh, high quality malt. To end, I have to acknowledge a lot of people. Uh, this work, have, uh, this is mainly done um, by this nice lady here. I think she's here in the audience. Sophie Malfleet was a part of her uh, PhD and uh, also Annelies Juste, which was a postdoc in my lab. So this was a nice collaboration between a group of Guido, our group, where uh, we uh, look at the microbes and Guido more at the uh, process. We also have to thank Albert Maltings for providing samples and IWT uh, Flanders for providing funding also to perform this research. And I would like to thank you for your attendance. So thank you, Professor Levant. Is there any questions? Uh, you looked better where it, uh, it should be interesting to look at fungi, that's what you said. But it's also possible that you see the difference between 2010 and 2011 because of the effect of the presence of molds and yeast on the population and the evolution of that population of bacteria. Yes, that's a very good remark, and I, I, I honestly also believe that uh, it could be an interaction be, uh, between the bacteria and, for example, fungi, and that these fungi are influencing the, the bacterial community. That's definitely true. So I believe the, today, if we would have to do this over again, I would look at the whole, the whole thing, the whole yeah. community. Thank you. Hi, I also have a question. I'm here. Uh, it's a very, uh, I think it's a very interesting topic, and uh, as you say, it would be also very interesting uh, to look at the, at the fungi. Do you think for the future there might be a future for uh, starter cultures for for malting? Could be, um, but the question would be uh, will be which which one to choose, and uh, what do we expect from uh, from this microbe? Um, what what we hope or. Or what you also can do here, uh, but not with uh, starter cultures, is to maybe to promote per uh, particular groups in the whole process. Uh, let's say, uh, if we can define a group which is important in the process, to promote them so that they are active, uh, abundantly present, and, and this kind of thing. That could also be an outcome of this kind of research. Uh, starter cultures as well, but I think there's still some work to do before we are there. Thanks. Can you explain why in one year you have a dominance of lactobacillus and in the other year you have a dominance of lactococcus? No. Do you see any, any possible, when you have to look at the metabolism of both types, isn't there any relation? Because that's uh, it's very interesting. Yes. It's because you can find a lot of bacteria, but there you have really a dominance of one type, and in another year you have a dominance of another type. So I think that's a, the question to think about it now. Is there any possibility to explain it? Well, I thought, I thought about it, um, but I have so far no explanation uh, why. Um, it's, it's a clear difference, but I have, if, if you have any suggestions, uh, you can let me know. But, um, Maybe. Maybe it's, it's time and it's interesting to find out the relations between the bacteria and the possibility of the presence of yeast and fungi. Yeah. Yeah, that's exactly what... Uh, yeah, well done. Yeah.